nerdy topics and discussions for people who aren't necessarily nerdy themselves. With you today, myself, is my nerdy tu- your nerdy tutor, George, and with me here, live from a remote location here, deep in the underground mines of somewhere not my apartment, here at my mom's house with my mom. Back at home. So we're on remote location here. Uh, we wanted to change the scenery a little bit. Um, and it's kind of fitting because there will be quite a bit of uh, craziness happening at the same time dinner table here later on this evening i'm told this is the scene of the happening and it's like they get here at like midnight they they start arriving about 11 and they don't start playing until like 11 30 or midnight yeah god it's such nerds yes okay so what we're talking about today we're talking about dungeons and dragons a thing that's probably now almost going almost on 50 years old here now in in 2020 it'll be or 2023, it'll be 50 years old, but it's about 45 years old at least right now. 46 years old. Wow. I know, yeah. And actually, this game even dates back even further to miniatures and a whole bunch of other stuff here. So let's get into a quick tutorial about this here. So um, contrary to personal belief, you've actually played Dungeons & Dragons already. You just don't know it. Okay. So... Can you imagine as a little girl playing cops and robbers, Indians and chiefs, having a tea set party with dolls? I'm more like a Barbie. Okay. I had oh I had a Mary Poppins doll. Okay, but you remember like playing with them and acting out scenarios and basically doing entire stories with them. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so that's um, that's basically Dungeons and Dragons at the end of the day. Here, the only difference being is that you're playing with a slightly more static set of rules usually okay uh, that everyone kind of agrees to play with okay so basically the entire point of dungeons and dragons is to group of people to come together to basically tell a story now there's a narrator to the story and then everyone else kind of lends to their to the story by playing their own individual characters with the narrator kind of leading everybody through everything and kind of helping guide the story or allowing the story to not delve into too much chaos Okay, so I have a question about this. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there was a Big Bang episode um, a number of years ago Mm -hmm. that showed them playing Dungeons and Dragons Mm -hmm. and had a narrator, and the narrator made noises, and... This can happen. Okay, so was that a pretty accurate depiction of it? Yeah, I mean, I I like to think of... I like to think of... um, No, Dungeons and Dragons in and of itself is not the only kind of tabletop role-playing game. It's basically what started the genre of tabletop role-playing games or tabletop RPGs. There are multiple different versions of this game beyond just this one here, which is a very Tolkien-esque fantasy. Uh There are steampunk versions. There are cyber, cyber future versions. There are Western versions that I've seen played before. Um... And there are ones set in space, there's ones for Star Trek, there's ones for Star Wars, kind of almost any sci-fi thing has its own version of this. I understand there's a Game of Thrones version. Yes, there is. So Okay. Um, so, but Dungeons and Dragons is what popularized it for the most part here. And while the Big Bang episode, Big Bang episode is fairly accurate to what you can kind of expect from that, like... It's it, it all kind of also depends on who you're playing with because everyone has kind of their own taste and flavors to how they like to play. Um, there's kind of three different ways I've seen it played for the most part with some variation in the middle there. You have um, a casual kind of game in which everyone just is there to have fun for the most part. Uh huh. You'll have people that are in the spectrum of super into the story. Okay. So the rules are kind of like an ancillary sort of thing to telling this interesting story and having the characters play through the story. And there's other people who are dead set rule, rule sort of thing. Like they'll pull up the book and be like, that's not the way you fight in C. It's two D sixes, not three. Like people like that. Okay. But these are also people who've also just like studied this book and many other books as well. So we'll get into the books here. In this just is a D and D player's handbook. Yes, and so, okay. but I'll, but we'll tell we'll talk about more about this here in just a second. So let's go just a quick history of the of the series here. Originally, Dungeons and Dragons started off as an, another game called Chainmail, which was the first. So 
back in the day, people used to paint figures and mini miniature figures here, mm -hmm. and they would have what they called tactical war games with the miniatures. Everyone kind of had their own different set of rules for doing it, and it wasn't until Gary Gygax and a guy named Dave Ar Arneson kind of got together and created a new set of rules that kind of, and published it. Because before this was just very much a hobby sort of thing, and nobody was really um, doing any sort of major publication for this kind of stuff. So they created something called Chainmail, which was basically the rules of miniatures, and it was very popular. Okay. Um, and then Dave Arneson basically invited Gary Gygax over to a different telling of, of Chainmail, in which they didn't have the miniatures at all, and it was more about characters instead. And then the two of them collaborated again, and so in 1973, 74, um, they came up with chain or excuse me, they came up with Dungeons and Dragons. Now, Dungeons and Dragons has had multiple additions to it here, each one kind of changing the rules here and there as necessary. Um, what we're going to be playing with here in the most per current version is a, a fifth edition here. Uh, okay. came out in 2014. It's well liked by a lot of people. It's 2000, 2008's fourth edition was not well received by fans. Um, they felt that it was very much condensed for the most part here and simplified. And what ended up happening here is that is that um, it made it feel a lot like World of Warcraft, which is also was very popular at the time as well. But, very, but World of Warcraft is an online game. It is, but it's also a lot of the stuff you can do is very sim simple. Is uh, has a lot of simplicity to it, but also you're very narrowly cut into what you can and can't do. Okay. So a lot of the flavor of being able to kind of like mix and match classes or pull abilities from other places were not quite so readily available to based on those rules. Okay. So um, I was told I could be Khaleesi, so I, that's all I care. There is the option to be a Khaleesi. There absolutely is. Um, there's a lot of different ways you, things you can do in this game here. So, okay. um, so basically, again, like we said beforehand, um, the game ha the game is basically people coming together to play it. So, typically, what I tend to find is four to five players is a good number of people to have. Um, the more people you have, the little bit more unwieldy it can be. Sometimes, like stories and adventures take longer to do. Um, and sometimes some people get more of a role versus some people who get less of a role. So some weeks, you're, sometimes when you play, you might have more of a storyline focus on you, or other times you have maybe less of a focus and you're just kind of in the background sometimes. As where if you have like two or three people playing, it becomes very difficult to have, that's just not two people trying to tell a story. So four to five people I find is, to, is a good number you can go at max like six or seven, but again, like it's to everyone else's degree. I've seen, I've played a version that was like eleven people with one game with one with one DM, and it was like ah. Uh. Well, the most and the most I've seen, um, it's your brother's group that meets here mm -hmm. on Friday nights at like midnight, um, and the most I've seen is six. Yeah, and it's usually it usually is four to five. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like a, that sounds like a manageable number at the end okay. of the day. So now they all have notebooks. Yes. Okay. So um, basically, there's two types of people that are playing in this game here. There are there is the people who are playing as, as their own individual characters, and there's a person that's known as the dungeon master. This is the narrator that I was initially speaking to. Then I also call a DM or. Uh, or DM or GM sometimes. Sometimes it's Game Master, sometimes it's Dungeon Master. Your, your group will, will kind of decide what it is. At now, now is it always the same person who fills that role? For different lengths of stories, yes. So in a lot of cases, um, if you're stuck, if you're on a certain set of characters, it might be the one person being the DM for a number of weeks, months, or sessions that you do. Uh -huh. um, in some cases, it might be a trade-off here. Like maybe... Maybe after a certain point here, everyone kind of goes back to the town that they all started in, and then they regroup, and another person joins them while the person one person leaves, and they become the narrator and, and dungeon master at that point here. So that okay. happens from time to time. Um, but again, a lot of this is all very much of how other people want to work out with one another, and that also comes very important when you're doing the player characters. Okay. Um, now, the reason they have notebooks is because... 
they have a lot of stuff to keep track of in some cases. Depending on your type of character, there's a lot of information to keep track of. The character sheets alone in the 5th edition here are, are anywhere from 3 to 4 pages. Well, and, and I have to say, first of all, they're a pretty artistic group because they've drawn their characters. Mm -hmm. um, and they're really intricate. There's a lot of people online that make good money just redrawing people's D&D &D characters in some cases. These guys are drawn their own. They're, I'm, I'm actually pretty impressed with the artistic ability. Oh, yeah, I know. So, um, so everyone plays their own character, and everyone has a number of different ways you can play your own character. You can be a... You know, You'll have, you know, ranger elves, you'll have, you know, stalwart, you know, paladins, you'll have tiny little tinkering people, you'll have half dragon people, half orc people. Um, like, Doesn't everybody want to be king? No, not necessarily. I mean, again, I mean, like, there's a number of classes. King is not one of them available in the original book, um, but there's a lot of different characters you can play. And I've seen a lot of people who actually even sometimes play to their against their strengths in a lot of cases you might get this very brutish orc is actually like an elder mage in some cases or this you know very hulking barbarian creature is actually a thief um or you have like the tiniest little creatures these gnomes and halflings um are basically like full-on like plate mail shield kind of holding tanks in some cases okay so um, but everybody's got a little bit different in how they want to play, and sometimes the character creation is the fun part of the game in some cases, just trying to make whatever it is you want to create. And we're actually going to do that next time, and we'll go through a little bit of how to do that here tonight. Um, some people actually, when they're making their character, can spend days making their characters or thinking about it. We're not going to spend that much time on it, but um, John and me have an idea of what we're gonna, what we'll do here. So. Okay. So um, basically, what we'll do is that next time we meet, we'll have we'll make your character. We'll do the entire process of making a character, and then we're also going to have a game session where we're going to play a game, you, me, and my brother. Oh, okay. And then, um, and then when we come back, we'll talk about it. Cool. So we'll be okay. able, so we'll be able, so we'll do that here within the next two weeks here. So we got okay. a little bit of time here. And so this will be a, this will be a longer series of episodes, but that's always good. This is all, this will be fun and interesting. Um, so let's see here. So yeah, Dungeons and Dragons is basically just a confined set of rules. And the way a lot of these rules are decided on are by this lovely book right here. So keep in mind that if you are interested in playing Dungeons and Dragons, you actually do not need this book. I don't need the book. No. What, what, so Dungeons and Dragons was originally published by a, game, by a company that Gary Gygax founded called TSR, which stands for Tactical Strategy um, Rules, if okay. my research me correctly. And eventually, while he was in the process of trying to get a Dungeons and Dragons movie going, as well as a cartoon and another other stuff here, which, yes, there was a cartoon in the 80s, it's... It, I want to say it was done by Hanna Barbera, but I can't remember if it was or not. It wouldn't surprise me for that age if it was. But is okay. So just really quickly, because you you mentioned a movie as well, isn't part of the point of Dungeons and Dragons that it allows individuals to carry out their fantasy? Why would you want to watch something it's, that wasn't your fantasy? I agree. Um, I don't think some games make good movies. A lot of other games don't in some cases. It would be like watching a World of Warcraft movie. Who... Well, World of Warcraft actually has a World of Warcraft actually started as strategy games and originally had a very detailed and well thought out story. And the movie does a decent-ish job of leading you through the story, if not condensed for what it was back in the day. Okay, so that's another that's another episode of yep. another podcast. Oh, yeah, okay. no, no, no. I, I, I plan, up? I'm okay. planning, up, planning out that one and having you play it for a couple hours. Ooh. I know. And now, now, that, now that we've got a new tool to do that with, we can do it here in the luxury of your own house. And so this will be fun. Okay. Um, so, but yeah, no, again, I mean, to find the most closest analog to Dungeons and Dragons might probably be World of Warcraft here. Okay. But a lot of this is all stemming from Tolkien-esque sort of hit fantasy where, again, Tolkien... Lord, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit really did, again, set the tone for a lot of modern fantasy as we better much know it today. Classic for a reason. Very much. Um, 
So, as I was saying, this book is not necessary. This what do, well, so the company that now owns um, the Dungeons and Dragons license is it's a company called Wizards of the Coast. They're the same people that make Magic: The Gathering. Okay. And so, um, what they've done here is they've released a hundred and eighty page PDF online. That's all this. That's almost everything that's in this book, with a lot of exceptions. So, the book is so. The guide has like four different races, four or five different races. It has like four or five different classes that are in it. If you just wanted to see what it was all about, you could use this hundred page, hundred and eighty page sort of little PDF you can get online. It has all the basic rules that you'll find here in this book. Uh huh. And um, but you could literally play a game with that here. Okay, so I'm looking through the book trying to see how many pages this thing is. And and I'm sure the PDF has indexes too. It does, but you know this thing's for you know 300 and some odd pages. Yeah, but if you look, if you scan through it properly, it's probably more like 350, because there's a lot of artwork. Okay. And there's a lot of very pretty artwork too. I mean, oh, don't get that me is nice. Yeah, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of pretty artwork in there that's very much in the intention of to spark imagination and get you thinking about stuff. Um, so that very, that's very much a, a big big help of the book here but you'll notice that you're probably flipping through stuff and you're looking at what looks like a lot of appendices and a lot of charts and a lot of like you know the text is not big it is small there's a multi-class spellcaster chart yes yeah they weren't they weren't kidding around when they came up with this stuff here there's levels in one through nine yeah and levels go through 20 yes and 20 is usually the max level most people will ever reach here to get beyond that, you can keep going further. But some people also do not really care too much about the experience points. There's a whole section on proficiencies. Yes, because you have to be proficient with a weapon to use it properly. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> clerics can have armor? Yes. And Cler shields? Yes. We'll talk about we'll talk about the individual okay. classes and races. And, All right. Yeah. Um, so what we're holding up here now is the player handbook. So if you really want so it's a decent investment at about like twenty five to thirty dollars online, probably twenty in some cases, depending on where you get it probably from. Probably available used as well. Yep, definitely can probably be used. Um it's a good resource to have. It's gonna have all the major core classes that are in the initial game here, because there's about nine to ten of them. Um it's gonna have all the major races here as well, so it's gonna have um, and more, more like lore on these classes as well, because even elves, for example, have like the wood elves, and then you have like the dark elves, which are don't like sunlight, as an example. Um, you've got dwarves, you've got mountain dwarves, and you've got um, hill dwarves. Where hill mountain dwarves are very much kind of like we saw in Lord of the Rings, where like they're mining underneath the underneath rock, and they've got like extra constitution versus yeah. Okay, so, so I just have a general question, and this is back to the question I asked earlier. Okay, so everybody who researches their ancestry finds out that they're, they're uh, related to Charlemagne or, or Henry V or something like that, <laughs> um, because nobody wants to be related to the, the wench that worked in the, in the bar. Fair. Um, who chooses to be an underground dwarf? I mean, doesn't, I'm back to my earlier question, doesn't ever, you're an underground dwarf. I was an underground dwarf for a while. Okay, wouldn't you want to choose to be? I want to be Khaleesi. Um, I, I was a very, I was a very drunk dwarf, and the more I drank, the the stronger I got because I was a barbarian dwarf. So the big deal was that I, uh, I wouldn't go into battle without drinking, and so I always had to be drinking, and I was always drunk. So a, a quick aside here. So, uh, my dwarf here was a barbarian dwarf. He carried two big giant battle axes, and he just wanted to fight and drink. He didn't really care about, like, prissy magic, and he didn't care about, like, he, if he got lost, it was like, great, I got lost. I'm going to find something cool at the other end anyways. And so he got in our group in a lot of trouble because he just let his mouth run. And so... Okay, so so characters like that can be the... the um, can be great strengths, but they can the, be, like, the, the, great The comic flaws. relief. They can be comic reliefs, they can be useful for the party, they can actually be detrimental to the party in some cases. I played a game one time where we had a character who was a 
who was a thieving rogue, um, but he had a flaw to him that said he had to always, he was a kleptomaniac. So he had to be stealing all the time. Okay. So, so when you're, you're forming your group and again, you've got your four or five people, Mm -hmm. um, do you go around the table and, and, and decide that each, like each, you're going to have one of each, each kind of class. Some people, some groups, depending on how you friends want to do it in some sessions, will kind of go around the table with all their friends and be like, Okay, who wants to be a healer? Who wants to be a tank? Who wants to be, you know, the barbarian or the fighter with close ranger? Who wants to be the wizard or long range sort of stuff? You're like, some groups will do that ahead of time and then start trying to create their characters after that. So again, like if you had told me, oh, I, w- I want you to be, a, I want you to be a ranger. It was like, okay, I want to be, maybe you know, maybe I want to be like again, maybe I want to be a gnome, gnome, and then maybe they have like they have like guns and stuff. So they're like, always like this giant rifle that they're carrying around that like shoots them backwards every time they shoot, but they always hit. Or so you, so that you don't end up with like three wizards in in a group of five. Now, mind you, some cases you do get people who you do get people that are like, okay, make your own characters. Nobody coordinates with one another, so you run in a group with like four paladins or four clerics or like. I had one time where it was one druid and it was like four barbarians. And so the druid was always just there in the back, just being like, it's time to heal up all the rest of the party here. Time to get to work healing everybody. And the other barbarians were just like, ah, it was like, stop. Let me catch up with healing. That that does happen sometimes. Again, again, your group will kind of, your group will also really kind of heavily decide. I played with a group of people that we, had a thing we called feats and flaws. Uh huh. And so the notion was is that if you got, if you wanted to, you could take a really great feat that we kind of made up on the spot in some cases. And if you got a really great feat, then you would have to have some sort of disadvantage associated with that. So, so a real flaw. So a good flaw. Or That's a good name. So in some cases here, like one campaign for a game called Vampire the Masquerade, which where everybody is vampires. I had a character that would said um, it took a flaw that was called the finer things in life, and it let me get higher level spells at the cost of uh, at the cost of basically not being able to wear anything that wasn't a four star item. So okay. like I had to have like genuine you know you know leather you know snake leather shoes. I had to wear like the finest you know the finest suits a lot around. Um, I also had to. I could not walk through a puddle, like if I had because to, you'd ruin your because I'd ruin my shoes. Oh. Or I, and we got to a point here where we had to escape in a vehicle in the sewers, otherwise the vehicle was either going to explode, and my character would not leave the car because he was going to go into a sewer. And we were just like, I can't leave the car. Push the car. What do you mean push the car? I can't get out here. It's it's it smells. <laughs> and my character could not do it, and we all nearly died because my character couldn't do it. I basically had to roll. I rolled high. It's like, okay, your character passes out the second they get into the sewer. Okay. So, yeah. So, like, I got a great benefit out of it, but I took a major hit at the same time because now I have to interact with stuff differently. Yeah. Sometimes it might be that you take a, some... Sometimes you might take a more physical flaw. Like, you might say... Uh, Maybe instead of having a single hand, instead of having all five fingers, you only have three fingers. So it might, you know, say you can't use certain weapons or you can't do certain stuff here, but the weapons you can use, you're awesome at. Okay. Or maybe it's like, or in some cases it might be a talking point, you know, so you get, I lost three fingers, but hey, I have really high charisma because of that. So I can charm the pants off of anybody or I can get through certain situations. These were, again, these are house rules sort of things and house rules much in the same way of, if you've ever played Monopoly, everyone actually is playing Monopoly incorrectly based off the actual original rules. And everyone has house rules for how they think Monopoly is supposed to be played. I actually played in a Monopoly tournament and and, uh, and people who do that... Mm-hmm. Um, Want to get stuck in jail. Yeah. Well, I mean, there are lots of things. So um, if you play in the actual tournament... Um, they're they are very strict about the rules because you're all having to play to the same rules. Mm-hmm. Actually, yeah, actually, was quite surprised. It was it's very. Fr- I saw a documentary on it at one point, yeah. and it was just like you watching. You're just like they have rules for making the game go much faster too. Yeah, 
And in, the intention is like getting stuck in jail because if you get stuck in jail, you don't have the chance of landing on other people's stuff here. And while everyone else is running around the board, they're landing on yours. They might be landing on your stuff here. And even if they don't land on your stuff here, they can't buy. They, you just you just bulk up your one single sets of, of land to like yeah. the highest level. Yeah. And then you just let everyone rush past it and hope somebody lands on it so you can take that money. Yep. So yeah. yeah. So there's an there's an interesting strategy to that. And again, there's same with this game here is that there's interesting strategies that some people do again. Some people will just play to their own strengths and create their own characters and other parties will a group of people will decide on how they want to do it here. So um but every every everyone's a little different in how they do this here. There's not any one simple way or or difficult way to do it. And in some cases no way is wrong. No, no way is ever wrong. Again, this at the end of the day here, this book is an example here. Is a guideline in a lot of cases. And I've played very casual games where this was just a template and we almost never cracked it open except to just build the characters. Okay. In some cases. Or to re look through the rules like, how do I actually roll this? And you would figure it out. as like, ah, okay. This See, I've done. never seen this book. And, and so I don't know if, if our group is... So this is just one book. So there's a group of three books called the core set here. So the next book after this would be a monster manual, which has lo almost any kind of monster you would ever want to have. So if you've got everything from goblins, snakes, crocodiles, I was told I could have dragons. Dragons, uh, half dragons, um, young dragons, old dragons, you know, like it goes through wolves. It, it goes through like a gambit of every single kind of monster that you might have. And it gives you the ability to... Um, also have kind of a rich lore and kind of all how all these monsters are to give you ideas and how to use them as well. Okay. It's very it's it's very useful tool for the dungeon master. There's also a book called the Dungeon Master's Guide that's more specific about certain situations. So it might be um, a situation where you're fighting on the ocean. How do you, how do combat how about how do rules work for that or um, it might be if you're in a castle or you're fighting against something else. Like, there's a certain subset of rules for that. Um, so those all exist on in, in that, that book there. That book's less necessary if you're just having fun and casual. Um, but if you're really kind of a stickler for the rules, it's a good book to have, if you, especially if you want to set stuff in, in different places and do it correctly. And okay. so, Talking about correctly. Okay. What's the deal with the dice? Ah, so that's how, so obviously it's still a game at the end of the day. And sometimes a game is a, is a chance of randomness at the end of the day. Much if we go back to Monopoly, the roll of the dice is actually very much a luck-based sort of thing here at the end of the day. You don't know if you're going to roll Snake Eye, if you're going to roll a 2, or you're going to roll a 12 most of the time. You hope you roll something that you really want, but you never know what you're going to roll. And so the dice are intentional to decide if you succeed or you don't succeed. And then if you do succeed, how much damage do you do or how much damage do you stop in some cases? Well, I've seen, I've seen on Big Bang Theory, mm -hmm. um, the, the role of the dice determined the outcome of, of something. Yes. Okay. You, you should always, dice, will, dice are a very integral part. And I've got you dice as well. I'll even let you pick the color of the dice because they gave me extra dice. Oh, very cool. Because I've, because these are not six-sided dice. No, these are... These are... They're, they go anywhere from a four-sided dice, which you would think would be doable, but it is. It's a pyramid. Okay. Yeah. Um, then you have a s traditional six-sided dice. There is an eight-sided dice, a ten-sided dice, and then there is... Uh, the penultimate 20-sided dice, which is a very common dice. I've seen this dice. Yes. I have seen dice that also go up to 1,000. Whoa. It's about yay big with very tiny little squares on it. So. Um, very strange. Okay. It's very fun to watch it uh, get rolled because it almost takes a magnifying class to figure out, okay, which number did it land on? That's what I was going to say. What, which number is up? It's kind of hard to tell sometimes. You, you hope you just don't get a 1 Okay. So, um, speaking of dice, a one is a bad thing. Okay. So, um, there's a rule in D and D that's called either a critical, a critical hit or a critical, a critical success or a critical failure. In most cases here, so a critical failure is a one, 
and a critical success in most cases here is the highest number. So in that case, if you're rolling a d20, it's a natural 20 is what they call it. Okay. Um, and you have to roll that. You can't, like, again, like, have, like, an 18 and then a plus 2 modifier to get a 20. It has to be a 20 naturally rolled or a 1 naturally rolled. Um, and the difference being here is, um, let's say, for example, you're running out of a burning building. If you roll a 20, you not only run out of the burning building, you do backflips while you're doing it. Okay. And so you leap out of the second window, you do a triple axle somersault in the air. Do, and do then you land. save the cat? And you save the cat. And you had the cat, and not only did that, but you threw the cat up into the air, and then when you landed, the cat fell into your arms perfectly safe, and Mittens was okay. Okay. Um, as long as Mittens is okay. But in the complete opposite version, if you rolled a one, you tripped and fell and knocked yourself out. And and you burned you and, and you you might and you somebody, incurred damage. You might incur damage, or somebody might have to come back in and get, save you, and they may perish as well in the process. Or or or, or the clerk's going to have to heal you. Yeah, heal you for probably so. Okay. Yeah, and so that's kind of the idea here is that like there's a chance to do it, you know, succeed spectacularly or to fail spectacularly. Now now, let's say you have a, a twenty sided die. Mm hmm. If you roll a 15, you, you get out of the building with, with good speed, but the cat dies? Well, I mean, you get out of the building, you might just be carrying the cat for... for you, you might have gone okay. in to go save the cat, you just grab the cat and you get out. Mittens it's might not be, spectacular. It's not spectacularly done, no. M Mittens' tail is cinched. Yeah, or you in some cases here, let's say if you rolled like a 5 or a 6, you went back into the building to try to find the cat, you never found the cat, and then you leave. Okay. So you never succeeded in saving the cat at all. Okay. Um, different roles will require different levels of success. Sometimes something that's really easy might have a low uh, threshold for that. So it might just require you to get like a five or a six. So as an example here, let's say you're a wizard and you're in a library where you would be naturally attuned to, where you're like having to find a book. If you rolled like a, if you rolled a five or a six on a D20, might just be to find the book that you're looking for. In but a you book. don't get to open it. You might still, you'll still get to open it. You're just looking for the book in this case. Okay. But if you rolled like a two or three there, then you're like, oh, you can't find the book in this big giant library. Try again. And trying again might mean wait 30 minutes in game time to have found the book. Okay. So who makes the decisions as to. Um, Success how, or failure? Yeah. Like, like who matches the intensity? To the roll of dice. So that would be the dungeon master. Again, they're okay. the major narrators, so they're the ones who um, also kind of help narrate what happens here at the end so, of the day. So the deal is you bring the dungeon master his favorite brand of beer. It's a good it's a good starter. Okay. You always bring him, you always bring the dungeon master your his favorite snack and his favorite his favorite cola or beer if he has one. Um, and you certainly play you for, certainly get the right background music that he likes as well. Okay, he or so. she likes as well. So, if, so, if, so if he or she is into hip hop, you aren't paying, playing country. Usually not. Yeah. Okay. But in a lot of cases, you might not be playing music in the background, anyways. Or if you do, you might have like a a mood music in some cases. Okay. It differs with a little bit of everybody. But yeah, no, yeah, bribing bribing the G, bribing the uh, dungeon master is not um, not a bad thing. It differs with everybody. I I just always think it's interesting to see um, who gets to match intensity because that's basically what you're doing. Yeah. And um, and it's and it's subjective. So I mean, somewhat, somewhat, yeah. Well, I mean, and as the dungeon master, you, I mean, you naturally wouldn't want to piss everybody off because everybody stopped playing your game, or you'd lose your role as dungeon master. And that sometimes does happen. I've seen some groups just completely like fail an entire adventure, um, and I've seen other cases. In in those cases here, we've, everyone's kind of decided like. Yeah, we all died. You want to try a new campaign next week? Or in some cases, the D the dungeon match will be like, okay, um, re-roll that. Okay. It's to see if you live. Because if you don't re-roll that properly, you're all going to die. Okay. So sometimes a, G sometimes a, D a DM might be a willing and safe DM dungeon master that might be like... He's I able to be manipulated. Well, not only necessarily being manipulated, but he wants to see the story still going, so he's willing yeah. to kind of let the characters win this one, or I've seen some where it's like, you know, like... He's an enabler. 
Yeah, I mean, one of the famous ones I've I've always done here um, as a starter here is that you go into a castle, especially in Dungeons and Dragons, you go into a, a somewhat abandoned castle that's actually got goblins in it, and inside there are really great weapons and tools that you might want to use later on. Um, and so it's a great way to kind of quickly buff your group for upcoming stuff here. So like, if you go in there, like, hey, you found a really great sword. It's like two levels above you, but like, hey, it's a great sword to start to have, and and you didn't have this before. And another guy might be, hey, the wizard found this great book, and he can learn these new spells that he wasn't properly supposed to learn right away. And well, okay, so so that brings up the point: how do you gain proficiency at things? You level, so there's experience and points that you can get, and that okay. can be in based on the player's handbook. The in the monster manual, they give you a clear outline for um, levels of monsters, and if you defeat it, how much hit points they have, what kind of attacks they do, and so also sort of, sort of like upping your Pokemon. Yeah, and okay. also like how much experience you get if you defeat them. Um, so all that does exist here in this massive book, which is one of the reasons why a good dungeon master probably has to know all of the stuff that he's using so a lot of cases like myself i would pre-prepare all the monsters i was going to use on little like index cards in a lot of cases and so i would have them with me and i could just kind of reference the index card and make sure that i knew what was going on with the monsters or the creatures or the mp or the uh different characters i was using here as well so we could always reference that and have that ready and always have like consistency with it okay um but that all really does depend on the the dungeon master and again like some dungeon masters will have a giant notebook filled of the exact story that they're going to tell as where some dungeon masters are kind of like i have a general idea where we're going i'm going to see where this goes and kind of improv it okay and I've, I've had a lot of great great success with improv uh game masters one of my favorite ones is a Went to his wedding a couple of years back. He was a great... Is so it Adam? Uh, no, no, this would be uh, Lalo. Oh, okay. Yeah, no. So he he, he had a great fun of just kind of um, ad-libbing kind of everything that was going on. He did, He had a general idea of what he wanted to do, but very much we were all engineering students at the time. So we were all very used to kind of manipulating and trying to find solutions and stuff that were very... At one point, we did a very Bond-esque sort of thing where we laid traps in a casino to get something out of the casino and then left it. Yeah, we were... Well, you were all engineering students. So, yeah. I mean, that was that was an interesting set of roommates. It would, Yeah, it would have been very yeah. interesting. And my favorite thing to do was always just kind of test them on a, on a couple levels just to see how far I could go with my character. Because it was always kind of fun that, like, my character got away with an awful lot just because I was being trying to be smart about it, like a smart Alec. And, like, he... I think he appreciated that way too much. My character got a lot stronger than everyone else did. Um, but even expect- it's, it's neat. It's neat because you guys are still tight. Oh no! Yeah, no. We still again. If I were you've still, been in everybody's wedding. I've been in everyone's wedding. Yes. Yeah. So if it, yeah. In when and if I ever could go back down south, love to go and play with these guys. Play games again with these yeah. guys so badly. Yeah. Um, but again, speaking of experience points, again, your experience points might differ on your house rules. Sometimes some people are, yeah, you got, you know, 50 experience points here this week. And other people are like, you got 100 experience points this week. Or sometimes it might be, you everyone, everyone got up the level, okay. regardless of what happened. Whether you, like, actually... Because as a team, you worked well together. Is you yeah. might work well, or yeah. it might be just the progress of progressing the story. You, everyone just levels up at the end of every night. There you go. So okay. you start at level one, then the next night you start at level two, then the next night it's level three. So, or it might be that, okay, you guys are still at level four here. Next week after that, it's level five. Again, house rules. Again, the book is the book is very much like the dotted lines in the road. They're just suggestions at the end of the day. You don't necessarily have to follow them, but it certainly does keep everything in order. Okay. If that All makes right. sense. Yeah. All right. So... Um, so, so speaking of the book here, as I mentioned it before, there are the three core books and there's a, about two or three dozen additional books after that. And the different books are wholly unnecessary. Um, different books add either, most of the books have what they have, uh, have in it called a scenario or they have a whole entire stories and campaigns that are in it. So if you wanted to, you could 
play out a full story and have it already pre-written for you. Okay. And you just have to kind of like go through the motions of doing it, especially if you have a group that's never done it before. Okay. But other books also do a better job of fleshing out some of the clay, you know, some of the areas in Dungeons and Dragons are also kind of adding either new races or classes to it or enhancing other classes. Like there's a book that's all about rangers that helps add more stuff for the rangers. There's books for the cleric and the paladin for adding more stuff to, the, to those classes here. So um, you'll find some people love reading, pulling stuff from multiple books here. I tend to find that if you can't find it in the original book, like the other books aren't necessary. There are great things to have as an addition, but not really necessary, especially with, especially for people who are just getting started. So now, it, do the do the um, supplemental books go into some of the? You want to play Star Trek Dungeons and Dragons or Star Wars Dungeons and Dragons or any of that? So that would be just entirely different games. Like for as an example here. Um, Vampire the Masquerade didn't work on levels at all. Okay. It basically was you get you get experience points, and to get the next level of something costs a certain amount of experience points. Okay. So if you wanted to do if you wanted to have a better spell, you would have to spend X number of experience points to get that. Versus in this in Dungeons and Dragons, you level up and you have a new you get higher stats. You get to you get a point to add to your stats here and there. And you might get new a chance to get new abilities, or in some classes you might get a special proficiency. Like okay. if you're a fighter, level three is kind of where you start kind of deciding what kind of a fighter you're going to be. Whether you're going to be have like a sword and shield, or you're going to have a like a big battle axe, or like a pair of dual swords that you use, things like that. Okay. So how do you acquire these things? Then you mentioned going through a castle that had those you know laying around an abandoned castle. Mm -hmm. If you weren't going to go that, which I think for a dungeon master is a great way to set it up. Yeah. Um, but if you weren't going to do that, how would you go about acquiring? Um, sometimes the best way to the best way to get gear is just to steal it. From who? From the corpses of things you killed, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Some, oh, sometimes you okay. can loot corpses again. Like um, I had a guy who literally got all of his armor off of a dead skeleton of a skeleton warrior. Because the skeleton warrior was a former warrior and had really nice armor on him. Well, true story. When we went through Jamestown, mm -hmm. um, which is a living history park. Yes. Um, your brother asked, mm -hmm. well, what if I don't... We were in the armory, and your brother asked, well, what if I don't bring my own armor? What if I didn't come across on the boat in my own armor? And um, the living history guide said, oh, don't be worrying. Somebody be dying soon. Yeah. Um, and literally meant that that uh, that you got things from people who passed. Yep. So so it's recycling. Yep, basically a giant collection of recycling. Sometimes you might find something, sell it, and there might be somebody selling stuff in town. Um, again, there's a giant dependency for different weapons. Well, do you earn money? You can earn money from dungeons or doing other good deeds, or you might go on a quest, and from that's being sponsored by the local town here. Like, oh, hey, the town's being harassed by uh, goblins, ogre. uh, okay. ogres or goblins in the forest here. If you bring me back ten ogre, skull, ogre heads, I will give you, you know, like, room and board for the next, like, three weeks or something. Okay, Which that... okay. so now on the flip side, do you have to pay uh, room and board here? Again, depending on your dungeon master. Again, there, there are literally rules in here for good good ends and bad ends and, like, you know, like, oh, hey, I, there, you're in a town and there's three different ends here. One is, like... The luxury top tier in one of them is the um, mid level tier, and one of them is the Motel Six. Of, of okay, so ends. if you stay at the Motel Six, what can happen to you? There must be a risk involved here. Well, again, there's seedy people. Maybe somebody might steal your stuff in the middle of the night, or lock okay. the door, or, or in some cases, you actually might meet new friends while you're there. So, so is it ever worth staying at the at the classy joint? Sometimes, again, like if you're at the classy joint, like you might get a much better rest, or. Um, you might you might have to stay in the luxury inn, inn or hotel because there's a guy there that you have to meet. Oh, Or, okay. again, and you might find a nice, good quest there that where somebody who's paying a lot of money to sell you sell you stuff or to have you go do something. Like, I was on a quest where we had to ferry one guy's daughter from one town, one, one kingdom from another kingdom, and the intention was that she was getting married 
but they sent a decoy one way with the, all the imperial with all the guards and all the soldiers and everything, and we went kind of the back way with the real girl with the real one, yeah. Okay, and you got paid to do that. And we got paid to do it, and it took us four and a half months to do it. Oh wow! Um, and this was every other week campaigns, so it took okay. us four and a half months to do it because we got lost on a giant adventure <laughs> midway through, um, and one session we forgot she was there. Oh. Well, she was following along with us the entire time, complaining as we got into a town, and one of our guys, who was very, who was a paladin who was very much anti-goblins, had to kill all the goblins in, in the forest to save the town. And the girl was like, I'm getting married. <laughs> you're making me late for you're the wedding. You're making me late. And they were like, they can't do it when you're not there, right? It's like, I, I guess... And so she waited in town, and when we came back, we all got chided. We all got like yelled at and chided for everything for for being the good, upstanding soldiers that soldiers and adventurers that we were, for killing all the goblins and saving the town. And she was like, and what we did is like we told her like, look, you can take the credit. So what, so while we got the money here, we gave her all the credit, and basically it was like, our lovely princess here told us to go do this to save your town. Isn't she a great princess? And she's going to be your queen soon. Isn't that awesome and amazing? They're like, yeah, that's a great, that's a great princess. Yeah. Cool. So it got better. Okay. And then the end of that campaign was the decoy that got sent ahead of time mm -hmm. convinced them that she was the real one and took over the kingdom. So And she married the, 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 the king. She, she married the prince and stabbed the, the prince. prince in the back and then became the de facto ruler and queen. And then what happens to our princess? Our princess, you know, basically had to prove that she was the actual princess. And when she did actually prove that she was the actual princess, she said, you know what? This hanging out with these adventurers was much more fun. I'm, you do what you want to do. And then, oh. and they all, and then again, like you were like, literally like sword at her neck. It was like, just tell me what you want me to do. It was like, go ahead and let her live. We were all like, what? Go ahead and let her live. Cause I found, cause you guys were a lot more fun to hang out with than everything else that I was doing. And I'll just let her know this, like, we can always come back and finish the job if she doesn't rule properly. So that was the end of the, and so that was the end of the story actually, which we thought was kind of interesting and fun. That is fun. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah, like again, it, but again, all of this is very much the, how players interact with one another and how the DM kind of leads the story here. And again, it can very much depend where, again, some dungeon masters are very casual, um, to the rules and very kind of lax about the story or some are very dead set. We have to get through the library. We're not going to go visit the cemetery until we get through the library and you find the darn book I was looking for and you'll get other G dungeon masters who are. So some of them just simply have a stick up their ass. Yes. yes. Okay. Like, like the, you, you'll find a lot of Sheldon's occasionally. If that make if if that makes sense. No, I totally get that. You you totally get, get you'll that. get a lot of people that are like Leonard that are very much let's just have fun, and then you'll get a lot of other people that are very much of the, no, we can't go through, we can't do this until we roll the proper number of dice. Okay. You know, so I guess so, I, I guess a better example might be a Leonard or Sheldon. So you know, you mentioned that the creators um, were also the creators of uh, Magic the Gathering. N not Magic the Gathering necessarily. So. Okay. Um, TSR at the point in the nineties, uh, went bankrupt trying to do all these additional things here. They were, okay. they had, um, they had basic Dungeons and Dragons and then they had advanced Dungeons and Dragons. So they actually had two different versions of it going on. And again, one was a more casual version and one was a more hardcore version. Um, you also had a number of things in the eighties here with you, with a lot of the, um, sa satanic panic, if you remember that at yeah, all, and a lot yeah. of people thought that Dungeons and Dragons was actually teaching p kids and other people here to be devil worshippers, which kind of almost the opposite here. Like, if anything, yeah. these were people like being kind of seared away from it and just exploring their creativity, right? Um, yeah. Which was kind of you know, unfortunate here in some. Well, level. you got that with Harry Potter too. Oh yeah. So so. Um, but it, I think it all ended up working out well in the end. Um, again, the company, TSR, went bankrupt trying to do too many things here. Uh-huh. Um, again, because, again, they did a Saturday morning cartoon in the 80s. Yeah, which, I have no recollection of that at all. 
vaguest of recollections, except I've seen episodes of it on YouTube, thankfully. Okay. Um, and then they also, Gary Gygax was very much trying to get a movie going uh-huh. at one point, which they eventually did in the early 2000s. It's not great, but it exists. Okay. Um, it's got Jeremy Irons in it. Should I watch it? No. No, no okay. Oh. No, it, you, it's... You could have named it anything else but Dungeons and Dragons, and it would have just been like generic fantasy number four, five, six. Okay. So good enough. Um, but again, the company ended up ended up going bankrupt, and it got bought by Wizards of the Coast, who were in the process of making Magic: The Gathering, and were like, "Oh, hey, great, we'll we'll take this as well." Okay. Um, and there's actual books um, for fifth edition here that are based off Magic the Gathering, which has a very extensive lore and study on it here. Like, there's a, there's uh, well, a I big remember, story on it. Yeah, I remember Magic the Gathering. And I, and, I, and I did too, but I didn't realize there was actually a story behind it at all. Oh, okay. And there's a very lengthy and long-going story on it. So, um, but that will be another episode. Okay. Um, so, let's get you prepared for what you might go be getting into here in, a, in next week. Okay. So, let's talk about character creation. Okay. So this will give you a chance to kind of think about what you're going to be getting into here and what you might want to start thinking about. Because again, like I said, sometimes making your character can take we can take you know days to do here, especially if you're um, uh, not stooped in a lot of different kind of lore and kind of different tropes and different kind of you know subgenres of stuff happening out there. I've seen way too much. I have way too many ideas just like floating in my head constantly. To make a character out of like nothing would be real quick for me in some cases, but um, but there's no wrong thing to do when making a character. Again, sometimes the fun is playing to your strengths and playing to your weaknesses, um, and sometimes it's a chance to just kind of again be different and weird. Again, like going back to my one barbarian character that was always drunk. Like I have only ever been drunk once, and even then I was very much a uh, I was very much a conscious drunk. Was the best. Well, way to we'll, put we'll it. take you sock, sake tasting. Oh no, no yeah, in no. Japan. We, oh yeah, when we're in Japan, we're definitely doing sake tasting. Um, but um, but I'm also, also not like a I'm I'm a smart aleck in a lot of cases, but not like not in like a mean way or a very kind yeah. of oh, like I'm not overt about it in a lot of cases. I'll make a dad joke every once in a while at work, and people will just kind of groan and mumble. But um, but I'm not like out there. Yeah. Out there drunk or yeah. weird. But playing some of these characters is kind of a fun way to just kind of, you know... Explore figure, that. Explore that. that. Yeah, yeah, again, I mean, this, I mean, it's in a safe environment. Like, you know, if I go too far... You're amongst friends. I'm amongst friends. If I go too far, my friends are going to tell me, like, hey, hey, relax. Yeah. And, you know, and there's no harm and no foul at that at the end of the day. Okay. And now it goes back to, again, going back to, like, cosplay here thing here. Like, I was going to dress up as a woman. I was going to do it around like people that I knew, people that I knew would be receptive to it, and I was going to be in a safe environment. And then if somebody didn't like it, I could be like, "You don't like it." I got about two thousand other people here that are like totally cool with it. Yeah, yeah. So, like it doesn't. So at the end of the day, here one person's negative opinion of it was like, eh, yeah, whatever. So, um, so there's basically about five steps to creating a character. The book will say there's a sixth one. The sixth one is just everybody coming together. Okay. And when everyone comes together, you always start in a tavern. That's just that's just the it, law. It, it, it makes sense. Yeah. So e- 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 even the Disney version of Rapunzel has taverns. Yeah. Yeah. So um, basically, what you need to, with five basic steps that they outline in the book here are choosing a race, and there's a lot of races. Then choosing a class to be. Um, then you get to kind of determine your abilities and uh, your stats. Mm-hmm. Um, then you get to kind of flesh out your character story and personality, and then you get to choose your equipment that you get. And all this is, um, the first two ones here are basically just what's here in the book, and if you want to use uh, different additional text to kind of like broaden that horizon, that's an option for you. It's not required. Now, can, can you be an animal? Um, there is a character that shapeshifts into animals, so you could be like an animal. Could but- it be a flurkin? Um, you could, uh, they don't technically exist in the world, but, um, but let me go through a couple different okay. races, races here for you and see if one of these kind of stands up for you. Um, you have your dwarfs, they're mm-hmm. short in stature, usually under about five feet tall or under, 
Um, they love mountains and hills. Um, and, and for those of, for those of you listening, we're both quite tall. Yes, we're very we're we're tall the individuals. Whole, the whole family's tall, yeah. except for one of us. Yeah, except for Lila. Yeah. Yeah. So um, they live for about four hundred years. With a very you know they're if you've seen um, if you've seen Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, you saw dwarfs. Okay. You know they the these were not hard to miss. Frodo. Or, or, Frodo is technically considered a hobbit, which is also right. also considered a halfling, because they couldn't technically call it a hobbit for licensing reasons. Um, but Tyrion. But Tyrion, kind of, yeah. yeah. Um, their um, halflings, actually, are small and practical. They're about three feet tall, give or take. Um, they live for about 150 years, but in, in their, the, the best analog for them are the hobbits, really. Yeah. So... Um, on the completely opposite spectrum, you have elves. And elves are slender and graceful. They live for like 700 plus years. Ooh. They have a somewhat natural affinity toward nature. And um, and again, if you think back to Lord of the Rings, this is like Legolas and, you know, and a lot of the other elven characters that you see there. Um, and there's a bunch of different variations on elves, like Dwarf's Head. Mountain dwarfs and hill and forest uh, dwarfs. Um, elves have like forest elves, and you have like uh, dark dark elves, which are drow, I believe, believe, I believe is what they're called. Um, they don't like the sunlight, as an example. Okay. Um, halflings have a couple different variations on them. One of them's more like a dwarf, and the other one's less like a dwarf, kind of. Okay. Um, next, based off the book here, you have humans. It's your everyday humans that are, you know, broad, they're just like the broadest spectrum possible. They're great at kind of almost everything, and they're not everything. They're just us at the end of the day. So if you just didn't so know what, what you want to be, okay. if you never knew what you wanted to be, a human would be the great easy way to start at. Um, you have dragonborn. These are part dragon and part humans. Um, they're equally. They're like six feet tall in a lot of cases. Um, so we'd be comfortable. We, we, we would be comfortable yeah. with them. Um, one of the benefits of being a dragonborn here is that you get a innate ability which lets you breathe um, some kind of flame or fire out of your mouth, depending on what kind of dragon you are. So if you're like a green dragon, you might spit out poison. If you're a red dragon, you might spit out fire. If you're a blue dragon, you might spit out like ice or frost out of your mouth. Like um, Not to the degree like it's like a giant ball of flame, but, like, you could, like, spit out fire from your mouth, sort of, you know, like... Okay. Um, but that's... Everybody's kind of got their, like, little specialty to them, in some cases, like, dwarves, uh, dwarves, halflings, and uh, gnomes, like, all are short statues, so they're a little bit slower, but they have higher constitution and higher... Um, Hard, harder to kill? They're a little... Not necessarily harder to kill, but they have a better stand, chance of being harder to kill. Okay. Um, gnomes are basically halflings and elves mixed together. Okay. They're equally short like halflings, but they have uh, more pointy ears on them. Um, they're more um, more intelligent in nature. They have a special class that's called the Tinkerer in later books. Uh, it's all about them just building contraptions. Um, you have your half-elves, which are basically a hybrid between a human and an elf. So you kind of get in what's great about that one is you can kind of mix and match the parts you like of both a ra of a, the elven race and the human race to kind of get what you want at the end of the day. Okay. Um, you have a half orc, which is a human and an orc, and they have um, generally less long lives. I mean, like, there's not very many that live past 60. Um, but um, if you've ever seen the Hulk, I think of the mm -hmm. Hulk. Okay. Um, again, they're, they're, they're built to be bruisers, they're built to be barbarians and fighters, monks, and they're just built for doing a lot of damage. They're not great at, at, at spell cluster classes or classes that require um, putting points in charisma, willpower, and intelligence, but they're, but they're great bruiser classes. Um, and then you have kind of the fun one, which is known as a tiefling. Um, and a tiefling is basically a human and... Uh, infernal hybrid and infernal in this case here is kind of a demon so they might have like so they might have like different colored skin and horns and maybe like a wing or two little wings and a tail here or maybe like hooves for feet instead of normal feet or webbed hands and nails like they have some level of like they're not like 
I guess the best way to describe it here is like they're really kind of a cool race to play because they're very mis- mysterious and they're very kind of trickery in some cases. But like if somebody sees one, they're like, that's a demon. I was like, no, not a demon here today, just partly a demon. Um, if you've ever watched the movie Hellboy, Hellboy's probably about as close as you get to a tiefling. Okay. Um, which would be a great example for that one there. Okay. Um, do any of those stand out to you at all? I like the half elf, half human. Yeah, it's a it's a good it's a good starting place. I to, like nature. Yeah, yeah, and then and the end, you get the, kind of the best of both worlds for that. Um, so let's talk some classes here, because again, really like, and keep in mind here that some races are naturally better at doing some stuff, but they're not, but it's not to the point of being detrimental. Okay. Like again, you could have again one of these big brutish orcs being an intelligent wizard or a mage and things like that here. They're not inclined to it, but they can still do it at the end of the day. And it's not and if you did choose to do that, there's not nothing really hampering you from doing it at all. But it doesn't take advantage of my natural attributes. Yeah, no, again it's okay. it, I mean you could offset that by being like this really kind of, you know, muscle bound sort of like guy that casts magic and then when you're out of your magical power you just pick up a sword and just go right wow. with everybody else and you yeah. would just fit right in maybe. But that, would be, that would be, but that would be something you design with your character when you do that. Okay. Um, let's see here. So, um, in the way it describes it in the book here, you have, and I think they just did it in alphabetical order here. So, you have the Barbarian. Mm-hmm. Um, think Conan the Barbarian. Okay. Um, not a lot of armor that they wear, but they are proficient in a melee weapon usually, and their basic abilities are about them being mad and angry. So... Okay. Um, their mechanic is a rage mechanic, which basically lets them kind of go into like a berserker sort of rage. Um, and um, barbarians, again, it's like the best way to describe it here might be um, the Hulk again. Like a Hulk would be a great barbarian at the end. Of, at the barbarian at the end of the day, like very little armor, or if, if any, um, and just going nuts, brute, going to town. Brute, brute force. Yes, very much a brute force character. Okay. Um, the second one here, which is a kind of a popular class, is known as a bard. Um, and this is a guy that like plays musical instruments, but you're probably more likely to be a sword. You do be uh, have a bow or sword, or maybe you know some magic. What's nice about this class is that um, it's not great at anything, but it's a jack of all trades. Okay. So well rounded. Yeah. So it's a very well rounded class you can choose. Um, but because it has so many different options and things you can do with it, um, it's not great for beginners because it just offers you way too many things. And sometimes if you take too many things in too many different areas without trying to like narrow it down, you can be a jack of all trades, again, but master of none. none. So, okay. um, but always as a bard, you always have to be slightly drunk and you have to always be a great singer or, or a songstress or some sort of like well-renowned sort of person. Basically, you walk into a bar and you're like the li- you're like the life of the town immediately. Okay. immediately so, um, the next one here is a cleric, and there's also a paladin later. But there's a subtle difference between the two of them here. Okay. Um, the cleric basically prays to a god of their choosing, and whoever they pray to, kind of they get com- kind of their blessing in a certain way here. Um, so you could pray to like a god of healing, and you would be a great healer. You could pray to a god of war, and you're a great like warrior in that case. So, basically, you, you're very much based off what religion you choose at the end of the day, and kind of gaining the blessings through there. It's okay. a good class to use because um, you get a lot of spells that you can use to help buff your party and use. In again, in the case of the healing sort of god, healing people, um, but it can be. But again, like even though it's a cleric, they're very strong on the battlefield and very strong in a game. They can be both a tank and a healer in some cases. Okay. Um, uh, then you have the druid, which I mentioned earlier. This is a is where if the cleric was all about his religion, the druid's all about the nature instead. The plant life, the trees, the animals, being at one with nature, that's how you gain your power, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a special ability that allows them to turn into shapeshift into stuff. So you can, if you want to shape it, shift into a bear, you can shapeshift into a bear. Uh, if you want to shapeshift into a bird, you can shapeshift into a bird. You usually can't do a dragon because that's considered um, part of arcane magic. Okay. So you can only do kind of natural stuff as where dragons are not necessarily uh, natural. They're more magical in nature. 
Okay. Um, but if you wanted to do a flurkin, you could do a flurkin as well. So those do exist. Um, a fighter is a lot like a barbarian, but whereas if a barbarian does everything, you know, with like brute force, a fighter does everything, uh, does the same amount of kind of stuff here, but does it better. Uh, with weapons and... With like weapons and, and armor skill. and okay. skill. Think like Captain America versus the Hulk. Okay. The Hulk would just smash something where Captain America would like throw his shield and plan out what he was going to do. A little more strategy. A little more strategy and been like training to do X, Y, and Z versus the Hulk would be like... So. Okay. Um, he's all, they, make great, they make good tanks in a lot of cases. And they have... You can specialize in different styles later on. That lets you kind of, um, like, if you want to be, like, a samurai archetype, of they're usually fighters. Um, or if you want to be kind of a um, big guy with, like, just a huge sword, there that's their guy there for that, too. Um, they're nice, fun classes to be in a lot of cases. They're easy. Um, now, if you didn't want to carry a sword, you could be a monk. And the really kind of only real difference there is that, like, instead of, like, swinging a sword, you punch and kick with your feet. Okay. Yeah. So it, That's somewhat limiting. It, it it can be somewhat limiting, but you get um, you get a slightly more spiritual sort of way of hitting stuff. So when you hit stuff, you use your spirit to kind of do more damage along with it that could not only hurt somebody, but also hurt them through their willpower and their constitution as well. Okay. So, so what's the difference between a cleric and a monk? Um. So a, a cleric is based off their religion, so they're gaining their powers from praying to their particular religion. Okay. Um, as where a monk is more like, um, again, like a kung fu master sort of thing. Oh, okay. Okay, if got that it. May, if that got makes it. more sense. Yep, got it. Okay. Um, and the next one here is a paladin. Mm -hmm. um, it's very similar to a cleric and a fighter, um, but more towards so a fighter in a lot of cases. You might have a religion that you're, that you're uh, working toward, but you don't pray to one particular god you pray to, you pray to kind of like all the gods in a sort of way so you're multi-theistic multi you can be multi-theistic absolutely um the real difference being that kind of denotes them is that you have a limited pool of spells that you can eventually gain over time but the spells are meant to augment your regular fighting okay um like where a cleric would use the spells to do the fighting and then pick up a base and join the battle Paladins already have the mace in hand, and then they might use a spell to help them out along the way. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Um, then you've got the ranger. This is a somewhat popular class because it's basically your bow and arrow sort of like long distance person. Um, you know, bow and arrow, tracking stuff through the forest kind of character. If you, again, if you watch Lord of the Rings, this was Aragorn or Strider as he was originally known. Okay. Um, you have a rogue. Um, again, one of my favorite characters was the guy who was a thieving rogue. Again, as a kleptomaniac, he had to steal stuff. Yeah. He, if he didn't steal stuff every four turns in the middle of a fight, he would just get twitchy. He would actually start losing uh, points into whatever roles he was doing. So occasionally he would just... Um, he would steal stuff from his colleagues and, friend, and other people in the party and then have to give it back to them. So you might be in the middle of a, of a fight... He would steal something from somebody, and then that person would go to use it and be like, nope, you can't use that. Why not? You don't have it on you anymore. I stole it from you. Greg! And like, yeah. Yeah, here you go. But it would take an action to do that, too. So, like, it was detrimental, but he also had a lot of the really cool stuff at the end of the day. Because he would just be, he would just be like, take a rock off the ground. You found a gem off the ground, randomly enough. You know, or pull, you know, take this stick of fire that's hanging on the wall. Oh, you've just activated a trap door. You've just activated a hidden passage. Now you go, now you can go back further into stuff. But that, again, but that works to a dungeon master's favor there because if you know the backstory of these characters, you know what kind of feats and flaws they might have. Like you can base, you can do, you can base your adventures around that. So again, I was take always, advantage of them. Yeah. So I was always leaving stuff to be found by the rogue. Um, with the intention that the rogue would find something interesting and either it would hurt him or help him. Like, oh, you found a ring on the ground. Do you want to put it on? No, I don't. Are you sure? It might be good for you. Okay, I want to put it on. It curses you. It's a cursed ring. So, 
That one was also fun because um, what we did for that one was that we uh, sent text messages back and forth. So he would tell me, like, I'm stealing something right now. And so I would message him what he stole. And he would never, and, and everyone else, nobody else would know what he stole unless he told them about it. And he sometimes didn't tell anybody about it. Or couldn't because it wasn't his turn. So somebody might, again, in, the, in a classic example, somebody went to go pull an amulet that was supposed to open up the door to a, to a vault. And, like, they didn't have it anymore, so they thought they dropped it midway back. And the thief came up and said, no, I have the locket. It's right here. Yeah. Which was kind of fun. Um, but again, a rogue is your typical thief. They're great at dodging. They specialize in doing small things really well, like picking locks or throwing daggers or like, you know, getting behind somebody's back. Um, things like that. Um, next we have a series of magical classes, as they are, um, that all are kind of the same thing but not necessarily okay um they all have the same ability to use magic of vast variety but it's kind of more about how they get their powers and how they use them okay so you have the sorcerer mm -hmm. what's interesting about the sorcerer here is that they're born with innate magical power so like uh it's like, inherent in them it's it's already something they already knew or something they have okay. like maybe they were like moving their fingers together and just started fire on their hands randomly. And so they were like, great, they're great at fire magic. Um, and what's unique about the sorcerer is that they're able to modify their spells. So they can make it shoot longer or they can make it um, uh, like a fireball grow bigger so it takes up more space when it hits, things like that. Okay. Um, the next one you have here is a warlock. This one is kind of unique because... Uh, what they end up doing here is they make a pact with a demon or a god in some cases to get power from them. So they usually get a lot of power from that um, creature, god, or in most cases demons. Um, but they have to pay something back to the demon. And in some cases that might be something as simple as um, paying money back to the god to keep the god's religion going. Or it might be something as like having to give up having to kill a certain number of people to get a certain amount of blood to pay back to the to your demon in some cases. Okay. So they get their power from from that and if they are, if they make their demons happy then yeah they'll get more. So they have to barter. They have to barter for their magic. Okay. Um, and the last one here is a wizard and so they don't they're not inherently good at magic. They don't even have magical abilities at all, but they learn magic over time and they can have the they have kind of the ability to learn every magic that exists because they they just specialize on quantity not quality as where um, a, a sorcerer would be like i have no magic so i can manipulate magic but i don't have a great qu quantity so again of a jack of all trades a jack of all trades for magic magic yeah yeah but they they still can be really good at certain spells as well if they focus on it okay so, but they have the ability to learn as we're like a sorcerer might just focus on like fire magic or or ice magic, the wizard might know like oh I know arcane magic and fire magic and water magic and air magic so they might have more variety to their spells. Um, so once so there's classes there. Does anything kind of pique your interest at all? Well, uh, okay. So if I go back to sort of the druid classes, is there a druid that's that's good with animals? Yeah, I mean there there's. So rangers have a kind of sub a sub ability to kind of be good with animals. So like they could have like a wolf or a, par a partner animal in some cases, um, and a druid in a lot of cases turns into the animals. I don't know that I want to become an animal. I think I just want to play with an animal. Yeah. You're still thinking the Khaleesi thing. Well, I, I like the idea of having dragons. Yeah. yeah we can. We can. There are certainly dragons you might be able to tame in here. Okay. So. Um, the next thing you want to do is you want to, um, after you kind of decide what class and what race you're going to be, some races have some innate extra abilities to them. Like the Dragonborn have flames that they can breathe based off what kind of dragon they're based off of. Um, dwarves have like a natural resistance to like poisons and things like that. Um, orcs have like a higher constitution and strength usually. Mm -hmm. So there's some innate stats that they get bonuses to. And then your class also really decides, um how you're going to, what kind of a cla what kind of abilities you have access to. Okay. So now you get to try to figure out what your stats are and what abilities you get. 
Um, and your stats are decided by the roll of the dice in this case. Okay. So you roll the dice and um, you can kind of choose what, what stat goes into which area. Uh-huh. So if you roll like a nine and you're nine, which is a really high stat number, and you want to apply that to the stat that's you know, going to be the most useful for you. So if you're a barbarian, you want strength. If you're a cleric, that might be uh, charisma. And if you're a wizard, that might be intellect or willpower. Okay. So you might want to put that in a high stat there. Um, and if you get like a really low So you have to be tactical about this. You can be a little tactical about it, yeah. Um, again, depending on how, what you roll in some cases, some dungeon masters might say, oh, well... Now you have to roll for strength, and your strength might be a nine. Okay, now you roll for intellect, which is your major stat. Okay. Oh, you got a two for that. Oh. So you might be like a wizard that's like really, really buff with a high constitution. He's really stupid. It's not, yeah, it's kind of stupid at the end of the day. Okay. Um, but then once you determine your stats here, again, you get some bonuses based off of your race and your class. Like, again, like gnomes are naturally more intelligent. They get a staff boat. They get so, a boat. so the dungeon master really has to keep track of every all the. the they will often have a second copy of the character of the person's. Okay. Uh, it, it, that just occurred sheet, to me. Sheet. Yeah. So, if anything, or what they might do is they might, hey, let me borrow your character sheet. Let me look at it. Okay, you do have that. Great. Or it might be like, oh, I didn't know you had that. Cool. Okay. So, um, that does happen from time to time. Okay. Um, but then once you figure out what your stats are, you can then start figuring out what abilities you want to take. Um, and abilities come in a couple different flavors. They come in like a passive ability where like, again, if you're like the bard, you have a naturally higher charisma. So you might have an ability that lets you kind of charm people by just trying to charm people by walking around. Yeah. Um, which is, might be a passive or an active ability to charm somebody. Um, if you're a uh, wizard, your abilities might be related to your spells that you take. Okay. So you might have a spell that helps you with your um, helps you with your constitution that, that helps you get a higher uh, ability to spit, cast more spells during the day, or you might spend it on more spells or higher rate spells. Um, if you're a barbarian here or a fighter, you might specialize in proficiency in weapons. So that might be. The choice of like, hey, I'm really good with swords, so I have a high proficiency with swords, so I can, you know, slice and dice you and make julian fries while I'm doing it. Um, and so everyone's kind of got a little bit of different stuff here. Sometimes your stats decide what you can and can't use, um, as where some classes have, some classes kind of share abilities. Like there's some cleric spells that are also saved for paladins as well. Okay. Um, there's a lot of spells that get kind of shared between paladins, fighters, and barbarians. Um, somewhat similar between obviously the sorcerer, warlock, and wizard have very similar spell access as well. Um, tieflings have a natural affinity toward magic, so they already get some magic spells right off the bat, even if they're not a magical class at all. So in a tiefling, you just get to run amok. Well, you're not necessarily running amok, but you're like also just like the seven foot tall elephant in the room in some cases. Okay. Even though you might be like five foot four and just have just you know have horns and hooves oh but you're very much like you walk into a room and it's like nobody doesn't not notice you so you're a celebrity even though you don't want to even though you don't want to be a celebrity i might want wings so i might i might you choose know, to be a tiefling. you might be evil you, you again you'd be infamous the second you walk around like everyone kind of knows you immediately for who you are um, that might be kind of fun kind okay of so um you don't we'll when we go when we go to build your character here like we'll have a slightly better idea of what we're doing and so we'll help you help get you some um help get you some abilities that'll be good to start with and work with okay um a lot of time what i do especially if i play a spellcaster i literally will just take the book and make photocopies of pages that that have my spells in it i'll just have them with me highlighted or blown up on a computer okay so i can just have them ready to go whenever i need them it's like yep i'm doing this spell right now and I have it just right at hand so I can know, so I have all the details on it. And then GM, if you wanted to, doesn't have to flip through the book to be like, uh, okay, lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt. No. Oh, here. Oh, cool, lightning bolt. Yeah, that's the way we remembered it last time. Okay. So um, I find that to be very useful, which is probably where the reason why they have notebooks just full of information. In yeah, because they all arrive with their notebooks and there's all sorts of, of notes and they're taking notes while they're playing. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, it, a lot of times they'll call that a character Bible, which is a keeping track of all the stuff that happened. Like, it might be a case where I met this li- woman named Lily. Whether she comes up or not again, who knows? But I'll bring it back up later, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Or maybe I've collected this one rare item here, and I just now want to use it. And But we forgot about it, like, three or four months ago when we collected it kind of stuff there. Like, so they're, they're keeping track of everything that's happening, so that they, they that way they can kind of pull it up later if it becomes relevant or useful. Okay. Fair enough. Um, the next part here is um, of your character is fleshing out your character's personality and story. So this is your chance to be, you know, whimsical and figure out what you kind of want to be. Again, if you want to be like a person that trains dragons here, like why do you train dragons? Why not, you know, hawks or birds? Why dragons in particular? So you might have a backstory that, you know, somehow you're related with dragons or you, your family's always been dragon tamers of some sort here. Or, you know, and what kind of personality would you have because of that? Are you like a taskmaster with your dragons? Are you just like whip them into shape? Or are you like the motherly loving type of person that like cares for all of her dragons, you know? So this is a chance for you to kind of flesh out your character and figure out how they want to be. Okay. And again, and like, this is useful for the dungeon master because again, if they know about your character, they can play to your strengths and, kids and also play to your weaknesses as well. Okay. So, like, let's say, for example, again, and I hate to come back to it, but I just loved it so much. Like, again, if you have a kleptomat, if I have, we are kleptomaniac, kleptomaniac uh-huh. rogue who just had to steal something all the time, I was always laying stuff out there for him to steal. Yeah. And so, like, he might steal something, and it was like, and I would tell him what it is privately, but nobody else would know because some, you know, because unless somebody was like, I am watching Greg right now. What is Greg doing? He's stealing something. What did he steal? And then I would tell him as well. But unless, but that was also a unique case. In a lot of cases, what will happen with a game here, you might have somebody who says, like, I want to look for traps. All right. Roll roll for, init- roll for um, intellect. And if they get a high enough score, great. You found traps. Do you want to disarm them? Yeah. Great. Roll another dice. You disarm the traps. Yay, we disarmed all the traps. So it's now safe to walk through the hallway. But it might be a case where... And again, I always like to, I, I learned this from Lalo where he was very de- devious with his characters because he loved the narrative of it and not necessarily the rules part of it, that he loved to keep information away from other people. So he liked to tell one person one thing and then wait for it to come up later if somebody else wanted to mention it. So it might be like, you know, I want us to, I want to, I want to see if that gargoyle is a real gargoyle or not. And he might say, he might, you know, whisper to you like, and you, then that person might tell the rest of the group, that's a real gargoyle up there. We need to kill that gargoyle. And it wasn't. Or in some cases, again, you might have, you know, you might, the GM, DM might tell everybody what's happening. It's yeah. house rules in that case. Okay. Um, one of the things that you, one of the things to know about when you are making your character, and this comes up primarily, came up originally in third edition, I want to say, which would have been in the 80, late 80s here. Uh, was something called the alignment system. Now, um, the alignment system, as um, beguiled as, as much as I don't like the system in a lot of cases, it's kind of useful for for doing some stuff here. It's um, kind of a nice way of just kind of painting a broad brush stroke of characters. Okay. So, you know, and every kind of archetype kind of fits into a little bit of this. Um so I'll show you an example here. So we have them starting off in a, we have the lawful good, the lawful neutral, and then the lawful chaotic. Then we okay. have the neutral, uh, we have the lawful neutral character. You have a true neutral character, and you have a chaotically neutral character. Okay. Followed by a, um, law, a lawful evil character, and then a lawful uh, a neutral, neutral ca- lawful character and then you have a a new, neutral evil character yeah and then you have a yeah and then a chaotically evil character and this is a this what we're seeing here right now we'll put it up on the website here is a meme that's based off of sometimes different shows so you can see each kind of personality so you can see Ned Stark is kind of a lawful good character because 
he does the right thing based off what the law is and he's a good upstanding citizen at the end of the day. Oh, it's honest. Yeah, Jon Snow, who is uh, very much a, I'm doing the right thing even if people don't like me doing the right thing. Yeah. So he's the neutral good character. He's, he's a neutral good character. And then you have the chaotically good character in Tyrion who's doing what he thinks is right, even if nobody else agrees with him. And even if it disrupts. In, yeah, and in some cases it might. Again, I mean, like, when we go back to the scenario with the goblins in the forest, it was a chaotically good character. It was like, no, we have to go kill all those goblins. Like, dude, we, the goblins aren't really bothering anybody here. It's just a bunch of, like, people that don't like goblins. We have to kill the goblins. So that was a, that's an example there. Uh, we get to the kind of the neutral characters here. These are kind of characters that don't necessarily participate in stuff. So you have, uh, I believe it's Stanton Baratheon, mm -hmm. who is, you know, following the law, whether it... He should be king. He, well, he should be king, but he's following the law and the rules, even regardless whether it's a good thing or a bad okay. thing. You know, like he's just following the rules. Um, you have the true neutral, or sometimes it's also known as neutral neutral. Uh -huh. um, and this is a person that's very much kind of um, out for their kind of their own being here. Um, this is a guy you... They, they don't care who wins as long as they're okay. They're just like observers of everything. Like, yeah. hey, we're just following along with whatever else is going on here. Like, we don't really have a... We don't really have like a skinny you know, skin don't have in the a, game. Don't have a pony in this race. Yeah, they don't have a pony in the race. No skin in the game. No monkey spot to curve a finger at. Okay. They're just kind of just like, we're just here along for the ride for the most part. Yep. Um, and then you have the chaotically neutral, which is only concerned about themselves. And in this case here, we have the hound, who's only really caring about himself at all. Yeah. Um, and then we get to the evil side of stuff. You have the lawful evil. This is Circe in this case. She is a, you know, I'm playing by the rules, but I'm doing evil things while still playing by the rules. Yeah. Um, then you have the neutral evil, which is a... An evil that's kind of out there for himself and doing evil things. Uh, not he'd sell his soul. Well, he'd sell his soul to do what he wanted to do here, but he, he knows what he's doing is evil and is intent on still doing it. Um, in this case, you have a little finger. Mm -hmm. And then you have chaotically evil. And this is just, uh, this is the kind of also known as the destroyer type. These are people that are just pure, unabrided evil that just want to destroy everything and don't care who gets in the way of them just having fun and doing whatever the hell they want and yeah. clearly we know the person that's the that's best for that so it's going to be Joffrey. Yeah. So um there is these are examples of that and then you'll find this in lots of different ones. I've seen an Archie version of this before. <laughs> that's cute. Um but I've also seen a number of ones for different TV shows, anime, saw one for um I want to say I saw one for Big Bang Theory at one point here too. It's it's a popular meme. Okay. But, um, but this is a great way to kind of um, decide or help notify your DM of kind of the broad stroke of your character. Okay. So it's, um, but what's always kind of difficult about a morality system here is that like your morality differs based off the situation. Yeah. Um, in a lot of cases here, like, um, and this is of course a bad example, but like if you, you might be racist toward tieflings. Tieflings never done any, did anything to you. They're just demonic races, but you immediately just assume them as being demonic. But you don't have that same problem with orcs. So as an example here, like, you might, you know, like, your morality differs based off of what situation you're in, and you don't... Well, would you ever trust a tiefling? You could trust a tiefling. I mean, like, there's nothing inherent that says you can't trust a tiefling. It's just that... They naturally look like demons, and most people don't ever see a demon, so they just immediately assume. Oh, okay. Demon. So let's go back to back to your your meme here. Could you be a chaotically good tiefling? You certainly could. Okay. Again, I mean, like, and that's and but part of the fun of that is figuring out how are you a chaotically good tiefling. Again, you might very well you might very well be like you might have your own moral code that you live by, and you have to follow. Um, and it's intent on doing what you think is right. And sometimes that might be, as a tiefling here, might be, I have to spread the news that I'm a good person. So I'm going to do all good things to make sure everyone knows I am a good person. Even if everything I'm doing looks really sinister and evil, but I'm doing it for a good reason because it's my job to do it. Okay. And I, I play that example as a normal hero, like a lawful neutral character might 
you know, a cart's running down the way, running down the street, and there's a child in the way, the hero might leap in to go ca- grab the he- grab the child and save the child here. Um, the lawful good character might try to save all the other people here and try to save the child as well, but trying to like keep anybody else from getting hurt. He's trying to mitigate the mitigate the damage, maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, he's trying to stay within the law. Like, hey, the child was in the road, and the cart's got the right of way. So, like, yeah. But you know, lawful in that particular case. So that'd probably be more of a neutral law, lawful neutral at the end of the day. Um, but then you have the chaotically good good character, and that guy might think, kill the horses, stop the cart. They did they, again. They're doing good with, with what they think is good, but their version of good just may not be. Has other consequences. Has other consequences, and they're not yes. really considering the rest of anybody else's appearance. You yeah. know? And then Tiefling, again, who might... I want to make everyone know that Tieflings are great great people, and so I'm going to do everything I do, but everything I kind of do is also Tiefling kind of, I know, kind of looking, and like I might just be doing magic, and people might be thinking of sor- doing sorcery against other people. Might misinterpret. Look like, misinterpret, yeah. and so like that's an example of one, maybe. Okay. Um, or again, if you're like a like a bar, and you just kind of like walk in to a bar, and you're like, "Hey, everybody, I'm the life of the party," but you're everyone just kind of stares and agape at you. You're like, you might have to find a way to get them all on your side. Yeah. You know, or maybe you have a hidden agenda for doing it either way. Anyways. Yeah. So these, these are some ideas to think about when you when we're when you're building a character, um, and the alignment system is good to help. Um, in a very broad stroke, how you think about things. It's not ever going to be, it should never be the definitive nature of what you do. Um, but to really know your characters, you're really the only one who's going to know it all that well. And if you have a dungeon master who's just learning who your character is, it's a great way to just give a broad stroke of who the character is. So that way people know like, oh, this is a character that chaotically good. They have their own morals that they're playing by. So, okay, got it. Um, the last element here, which is not the most important in some cases, is choosing your equipment. Okay. Um, now, if you're a, a person that's more melee focused or requires or is more on your equipment, like a ranger who really care, you know, ranger's going to have a lot more concern about the bows that they, the bow that they have and the arrows that they use. Um, a fighter's obviously going to care more about what kind of weapons and armor they have. Um, a wizard would certainly care what kind of like robes they wear and what kind of staff they might be carrying or a wand they might be carrying or maybe they have a grimoire kind of like book that they carry around with them. Like, okay, it's basically the equipment that you start with. Some games give you a allotment of money that you can bu- that you can spend. Okay, and then some game some GMs are like you roll for how much money you have. Okay, and it might be like you might be the super buff strong guy, but you got like ten gold to your name. So you can barely you can barely buy a sword, a helmet, and a shield. Um, and then other times you might be the lowly monk with like a million gold in there, but you're like, I can't, don't really need the weapons at all, and I'm really a light armor guy anyways. I'll buy some nice shoes. Okay. So fair enough. That can I happen. I like nice shoes. Um, and this book here has a giant appendency of like lots of you know of different things here. Everything from like magical swords and specially designed arrows and staffs that do x y and z for you you know it's got a lot of great examples here um when i go back when we go back to my castle example is my first starter one the abandoned castle with goblins in it Uh uh-huh i purposely leave something that would be useful for each one of the characters in there that they can take with them and when they leave so they're just a little bit more powerful than they need need to be, which helps them along along the way. Helps them skill up. Yeah, or okay. it might be like I give them something useful that actually comes into being something else later. Like, um, they're in the original Hobbit movie. In the movie, Hobbit movie here, there's a sword um, that's called. Uh, there's a sword that the goblins all know about, but the hobbits, the team of hobbits and dwarfs, just find it lying around and don't realize what the sword is at all. Um, they just realize it's like a really well-made sword. Yeah. But when the goblins see it, the goblins are like, I know that sword, even if I've never been cut by that sword before. That's a goblin slaying sword. And they're like all super paranoid of it and, and scared of it. 
And sometimes that's fun to drop into a story like, oh, hey, there's this nice, funny-looking amulet. You put it on. The amulet doesn't do anything, but it might be valuable. I'm going to take the amulet with me. Okay. So, and in some cases here, I, somebody sold the amulet, and it was like, you sure you want to sell that amulet? It's like, yeah, it's not worth anything. You said so as much. It's like, okay. Next week, hey, you remember that amulet you sold? It looks very similar to the spot here in the wall that it might fit into. So they go back to town and barter with the guy for the amulet. Try to get it back. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but yeah, if you're choosing your equipment, it's kind of the last real stage of it here. And then obviously the final one, according to the book, is just everyone coming together in the tavern and starting the quest. And it might be that, oh, hey, I know you from archery school or something, or I knew you from the village, or we're all just random strangers and we're all like, hey, I need a guy to help me with a quest. And you're all like, I'll go do it. And you just meet everybody along the way. Okay. That happens a lot of the time. All right. So, yeah. So, um, some stuff to think about here. Um, I will lend you a copy of my book if John, if John doesn't have a copy for you to read as well. Okay. I'm sure he does, though. Okay. Um, and I am going to prepare an invention for you. I have an idea for a character, but I'm not going to spoil it on the podcast. Okay. And I'll give you an idea of what, what we'll do here, in a, do here in a couple weeks with our characters. Um, and so we will, we will find a fun way to have this for you. Oh, very good. I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Absolutely. So um, I'm going to put all my detailed notes here because I have about six pages worth of notes on this. And some stuff I didn't, we didn't even get a chance to go through here at all, so... Okay. Um, but I think we've already been at this for a good hour and 40 minutes already. So I think it's a good place to stop at a hundred minutes. So, okay. um, so all this information is going to be on our, our website, the nerd tutorial podcast.com. Uh, we're going to post this also uh, links to this on our Facebook page as well. And I'm going to also link to the 180, uh, 180 page beginner's guide and basic strategy book that again, Dungeons and Dragons, Wizards of the Coast put out there for everyone to literally grab for free very cool yeah that's, and, that's actually a nice thing yeah it's, it's very much kind of um it's very much a little like hook and bait sort of thing like if you yeah. if you get it and it's useful for you you might want to grab the rest of the book to be learned how to play you know druids or a paladin yep you know where that kind of stuff is not in the this 80 180 page thing perfect um and so that's a great so i'll link that on our facebook page and on the website here as well um and then of course if anybody wants to add or has any comments or questions for us uh, you can always visit me at nerd underscore tutorial on Twitter and let me leave me a message, and I'll be more than happy to continue the conversation there as well. And so on behalf of myself, your nerdy tutor in our remote location here today, we thank you so much for joining us here today, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye.